So this is the reactant. What does hydroboration oxidation even do? <laughs> what is the reaction? Just forget there's a reactant up there. Just what does hydroboration oxidation do? What functional group does it produce? Hydroxide groups, OH. Okay, so then the question is, why do we have this technique? What is special about it? Makes it like an anti-Markovnikov addition, okay? So um, what you would expect then is, here's the more substituted carbon here. So you'd expect the addition to take place on the other carbon. So the result is... And then I have another question, because I didn't draw the stereochemistry. Um, what is the stereochemistry of the hydroboration reaction? You guys remember? You remember how it works? The boron is the electrophile, and when it pulls the pi bond and makes the sigma bond to the boron, it also transfers the hydrogen at the same time. Since those things have to happen together, it has to be a sin addition because they have to be on the same side. If it was a, if it was a stepwise process, then it could happen that you attach the boron, form a carbocation, and something else attaches. But that, just that pause in the mechanism allows for the stereochemistry to be a different way. But this way, because they have to happen at the same time and because it happens on a pi bond, they both get added to the same side. So that means... If I've drawn this OH, right, it has to be on the same side as the hydrogen that was also attached. So if the OH is up, oops, that means the hydrogen also has to be up and that the methyl group that was attached at that point has to be down, okay? If, if I do this reaction, though, remember the hydroboration can, the, the, that part of the reaction, the hydroboration is the first part, right, step one. The hydroboration could also happen on the, on the back side of the molecule. So that means the OH could be in the back. And then the CH3 group would be in the front. A lot of times they won't draw the H that's in there. They'll just show that the other groups moved forward. But I'll put the H in there. And then you end up, again, this group, the one I'm coloring in right now, that methyl group doesn't change its orientation during the reaction. So these are paraphase stereomers. Okay. Um, similarly, if you're looking at this molecule, The hydrogen can add, well, the OH and the hydrogen add on the same side. So what that means is it could go like this. Okay, now, or, sorry, or it could go like this, and we'll fill in some stereochemical details here in just a second. Because you do lose, by drawing it this way, you do lose some information in drawing it flat like this. Oops. Okay, so is that a, uh, are those, what's the relationship between those two? It's kind of a trick question because I haven't drawn it correctly. Like if there were no other stereo centers, they would be enantiomers of each other. It would be mirror images. It's a little bit hard to see, but uh, <clears throat> if you would f if you flip this over, these groups would be coming forward, and then there would be mirror images of each other. One of the things you have to be a little bit careful of is in this drawing style. They're actually implying stereochemistry right here. And there's actually a hydrogen at this point, and it's going down. 
So that means over here I actually have another hydrogen and another hydrogen. Like that. Oh, underneath the big finger. I had to reset the program, and so now I'm in the desktop trial mode, so I don't know what that means. But I get a big finger on my display. <laughs> Sorry. Sounds bad. All right? That makes sense? Okay. So, uh, don't show that again. All right. Hydrogenation, uh, catalytic hydrogenation is also syn addition. Okay. So I covered, I'm pretty sure I covered this the other day, but it's going to review it just in terms of the problems. Because it's a syn addition, the hydrogens add from the same side. Uh, and as a result, when you have an alkene and you do a syn addition, the groups that are on the carbons uh, of the, uh, the carbons of the pi bond need to both be pointing in the same direction. So this kind of enantiomeric pair is never observed in that kind of reaction. Okay. So what you would expect to see instead in a syn addition is something that looks like this instead. And if there's no other stereocenters, then you get a pair of enantiomers for them. Um, why is it a syn addition for catalytic hydrogenation, Mr. Persimmon eater? You need to have that bright orange persimmon in your hand, and I'm just going to ask you a question when I see it. It's like, oh, look, bright orange. I should ask orange a question. Because we're using, um, it's catalytic, so we have a metal Yeah, surface. metal surface. We have a heterogeneous catalyst, right? So it's like this, yeah. and that's where it's taking place on the elements. Yeah, side. and since the hydrogens are added from the surface, it may not be concerted in the fashion that the other one is, but the, the pi bond gets stuck to the palladium or metal surface. One hydrogen adds, and then because it's still stuck on the surface, the other hydrogen adds has to ha add on the same side. Okay. Um, um, but, I'm, but I'm gonna skip this because I'm pretty sure I talked about this. If I skip something I didn't talk about besides this, uh, let me know. Okay. No, I'm not gonna do asymmetric. Well, I talked, I talked about halogenation. Let me, let me skip through all this. Hang on. Um, I talked about halohydrin formation, at least the mechanism. Ah, so dihydroxylation. I seem to have killed the program. I think it's going to tell me of some error that's come up here in a second. Ah, desktop issue. There we go. I think. Okay, so um, dihydroxylation, uh, ignore the anti part for now, but the a dihydroxylation is what happens when you put in OH, two OH groups on a molecule. And we had talked, because I brought it up earlier, about the epoxidation reaction, the formation of an epoxide ring. And I talked about under acidic and under basic conditions, the second hydroxyl group gets added. So. I'll go back through and review some of that, but let's really quickly go through what the reaction does, okay? So we use a, a peroxy acetic acid, and the peroxy acetic acid on an alkene uh, produces a three-membered ring known as an epoxide. So you can bring a nucleophile in and break one of the bonds of the epoxide ring. So one of those two can get broken. The other thing to recognize is when the epoxide forms, it doesn't have to be going up, it could be going down. In this molecule, it's symmetric, so it doesn't matter. Because if you flip it over, you get the same molecule. But not all epoxide-containing molecules are symmetric, so just recognize this OH, this O group can be pointing in the upward direction or it could be pointing in the downward direction. So here's... The next step, under acidic conditions, and this is what they're showing here, that the hydrogen from whatever the acid is will protonate the ring, and then you always get the anti-addition of the second OH group. Okay, so why is it an anti-addition? Remember, remember what I said before, it's an SN2-style reaction. 
Even though we ha sometimes have tertiary carbons, it's still an SN2 style reaction. Why is it anti? Yeah. Yeah, this is in the way. So if the nucleophile tries to come in over here, it's going to run into the oxygen, right? And the oxygen is going to keep it from acting as a nucleophile. So it has to always, the nucleophile always has to come from the other side. I will just say, just generally, it doesn't have to be water as your nucleophile. So you could put like an ether group in there, or you could put a hydrox another uh, oxygen-containing functional group or sulfur-containing functional group, anything that can act as a nucleophile, and it'll be an anti-addition, okay? Part of the reason for the why this reaction works is because there's a lot of strain. This is a small three-membered ring. Like the oxygen's not large, and so there's a lot of strain in that ring. And as the nucleophile comes in, it allows the molecule to break the strain. What is the E-head in there? Oh, and the enantiomer. Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The other thing to think about in the mechanism is that this reaction is regioselective. And that's what I brought up when I talked about this reaction the other day. Actually, what kind of ring am I dealing with here? change the molecule a little bit, okay? I added an R group over here. Under acidic conditions, when this oxygen is protonated, okay, this rea and, and it's not a symmetric uh, in epoxide anymore. It's asymmetric because it has an R group sticking off over on this side. When the nucleophile comes in, it prefers coming in through the more substituted side. And the reason for that is, and I talked about it, I laid it out on a slide, you can go back and look at it, um, is because in the transition state, there's going to be that positive charge and has to move from one side of the molecule to the other, and it's easier to go through a more substituted carbon. Okay, so when the nucleophile comes in like this, in the transition state, the nucleophile will be picking up the positive charge, and it has to go directly through this carbon. On the other hand, if I had done this reaction with sodium hydroxide, it would have worked. It would have gone through the less substituted carbon. Because remember, more substituted carbons like positive charge is better, less substituted carbons like negative charge is better. Or I should say dislike them less, but whatever. You get the idea. I think you get the idea. If you don't get the idea, let me know. Uh, this is the mechanism for the uh, epoxidation reaction. Um, the oxygen essentially is performing the same role as um, the bromine and the bromination reaction or the mercury and the oxymercuration reaction is both the electron acceptor and the electron donor, so it's acting as a nucleophile uh, and the electrophile at the same time. Uh, we don't spend a lot of time talking about it, but this epoxide bond, oops, well, I picked the right pen, there we go. That epoxide bond is relatively unstable, okay, compared to the product. And when it breaks, uh, that's what drives the formation of the epoxide ring. Because remember, the epoxide ring's unstable, so you have, to, you have to have a relatively unstable reactant in order to make it work, okay? Um, by the way, that is a general principle. The, the more stable a reactant is, or the more, uh, sorry, the, uh, the more unstable a product is, the more reactive a reactant has to be, right? The more you have to force the conditions of the reaction. Um, sorry. Uh, it's a concerted reaction. Uh, try to remember that mechanism. I may ask it on a test. Wait, that's all I'm going to say about it.
So I'm going to skip over these things because we talked about all this. So we can also do what's known as a syn dihydroxylation. And a syn dihydroxylation means both oxygens are added from the same side. This is a concerted uh, reaction. Uh, the reagent that's often used is osmium tetroxide. It has some problems in that it's very expensive and it's poisonous. All right, but it's organic chemistry, so you learn to deal with these things. Uh, but the pro <laughs> what they worry more about than the toxicity, I think, is how much it costs. So they figured out ways to, I know that's, this sounds bad. They figured out ways to make it cheap so that they can use it more often. So I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but in essence, what happens is uh, you form um, this osmate ester. Um, an ester, if you remember right, is like we think about we think about uh, esters as being R groups on both sides. An osmate ester just has osmium in the center uh, instead of a carbon. And it has this, the, the carbonyl group and the oxygen containing it. And just for fun, I always like drawing this one. Oops. That's a phosphate ester. We see those in biology all the time, right? And you, you know you hear that term, the phosphodiester bond in biology? This is the diester bond because you got two R groups on a phosphate. Okay, so, um, but yeah, ester just means that general structure there, really. Okay, and then what happens is uh, the osmium is uh, reduced and removed from uh, the ring, and you get this dihydroxylation product. And it's a sin because the osmium can only attach from one side. The uh, way they make this cheap is they include a um, secondary reagent, which helps to regenerate osmium as a catalyst during the reaction. So this NMO, which is this compound here, is used to help recycle the osmium tetroxide during the reaction. Now, uh, you'll often see permanganate used in the reactions uh, for these kinds of things, but it turns out per permanganate has some problems where it tends to cleave the double bond instead of add dihydroxyl groups. Um, but it can be used the same way. It's kind of nice because it's a lot less toxic than the osmium is, right? And it's very cheap. I don't know if you've, you've all used permanganate before in your life, right? But under basic conditions, permanganate can be used to do a dihydroxylation reaction. Okay, let's see. Since you're putting it under basic conditions, it's pretty easy. Yeah, putting it under basic conditions is pretty easy, but it still has this problem of being, it's a really strong oxidizing agent. So if you have an alcohol converted into either carboxylic acid or an aldehyde. Or, so so yeah. even under basic conditions, it's still? Yeah, it'll still react. But again, if you can use it, it's a lot cheaper. OK, so this one's fun. Um, this is known as an ozonolysis reaction. Uh, and what the ozonolysis reaction does, and you can see it right there, is it takes an alkene, oy, 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 takes an alkene and cuts it right there, and actually puts an oxygen on either side. Uh, what we'll learn, and, and so that's, these are the resulting products. So an easy way to, if you're given an ozonolysis reaction, to figure out what the products are, is just draw a line on the, through the pi bond and put an oxygen on either side, and those are, those are the products. Okay. The other thing is true, too. If you're, trying, if you're not given the reactant and you're given the product, an easy way to figure out what the reactant is is just do the reverse, right? Where the oxygens are, just fuse it together. You'll see. It's not as easy as it sounds, but it's pretty easy. Um, so the, what the ozone does, <clears throat> think about what ozone's uh, Lewis structure looks like. It's down here. This side is what? Electrophile or nucleophile? 
nucleophile, got negative charge and pair of electrons. This side actually is an electrophile, and the reason it's an electrophile is because of the positive charge that's on the oxygen. And when presented with a pair of electrons, it's showing the resonant structures here, but when presented with a pair of electrons, oh man, my computer's like dog slow right now. I'm moving, I'm not doing that. Like I'm going to point at the screen. See, I'm not touching it, it's still there. When presented with a pair of electrons here, the pi bond can break back to here and get rid of the positive charge, and so that makes this oxygen an electrophile, okay? So when you put ozone in the presence of a pi bond, it has that same characteristic of being nucleophilic and electrophilic at the same time. And so it attaches to each end of the pi bond. One side, the electrophilic side, breaks the pi bond, and the other side, the nucleophilic side, attaches to the, where the carbocation would have formed on the other side. Okay? So think about how, that, how I'm saying that happens. Here's a pi bond. Here's an ozone molecule, like that. This is the electrophilic side. That's the nucleophilic side. So the electrophilic side is going to break the pi bond. The positive charge will end up over here, but then you have the negative charge over here, so it attaches itself like that. At the same time, one of these uh, two bonds, the pi bond of those two bonds, has to go back like that. And you end up with this intermediate species that looks like this. and all the charges are gone. So the mechanism starts out like that. And this is an ozonide. They call it a mole ozonide. I'm on, on, to be honest, I don't know what the mole means, but it's whatever it is. Uh, it's an ozonide. It's an ozone attached to a molecule. Okay? And then it does this really cool thing. I mean, I've always thought this was really cool. You'll notice the sigma bond breaks here, and this sigma bond breaks here. Again, that's an epoxide-like bond. Sigma bond breaks, electrons go to here, and you get this, these intermediates. So you get two intermediates. What it actually does is the molecule, this part of the molecule, flips over. It breaks away, flips around, and reattaches. Yeah, I know, it's like magic, right? So when it does that, then, you end up getting this ozonide, which can be isolated. This ozonide gets formed. So these two oxygens represent these two oxygens. Okay, let me highlight that if I can, without things crashing or down around me here. So these two ox, oh, good, good, galorty. Make it smaller. Can't make things work. All right, well, I'll just try it. That works, okay. These oxygens are these two, and that wasn't much of a color change. This guy this one. Ah, you can sort of kind of see it. Uh, then what they use is a uh, reducing agent. There's a couple of different reducing agents that they use on the ozonide to uh, produce the product. Um, they fall in two categories. Your book only talks about one. One category is a reducing agent. The other category is oxidizing agents. Okay, so peroxides are oxidizing agents. Or reducing agents are things that can donate electron pairs. So one of the standard uh, reducing agents is just zinc that can cause the reduction. Uh, the other, one of the other uh, reducing agents is the one they show on the previous slide, which is this stuff called DMS. And DMS is just dimethyl sulfide. Okay, so DMS, if you want to write it down, mild reducing agent. Uh, one can be that, and the other one is CH3 
S C H three. There we go, like that. So which oxygen is the one that ends up getting removed? Is it the top one? You know, I don't know off the top of my head right now. I know that's been studied, but that's all I can tell you. Let's think about this. Hmm. No, not coming to me. I'll look at it later and I'll figure it out. Okay, so what's the major product for the top reaction? Right, how are you going to do it? How are you going to write it out? Bunch of methyl groups. What's the product for this reaction? How do you do it? What's that? Cut the double bond, yeah. You're going to have an oxygen here and an oxygen here, right? So if you want to draw it out, you could number these actually. One, two, three, four, five, six, like that. And just go one, oops, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then on number two, you have this. And on number six, on number six, you'll have this. Now on number, what's that? One, two, three. I don't know, what did I do? One, two, three. Waiting for the three to cancel. Yeah. Oh, yeah, four. You're still missing the one. I, I have an extra three in there. <laughs> I don't know why that happened. Okay, so between two and six, right? So this is one, two, three four, five, six. So that's where I know the oxygens are attached. And on carbon number five, which way should that group be going? No, it's not flat. I would contend that it's still like this. Okay. Uh, how would you know? Yeah, assign the configuration when you have a stereo center. Assign a configuration, right? And then check it. So up here, because the configuration is not going to change because nothing is happening at the stereo center, the configuration is going to stay the same. So if we call this 1 and this 2, and it's going like this, so this is S, right? This is 1, this is 2, and it's going like that. So it's still S, okay? On the other hand, uh, if it had been on number 4, I think it would have flipped. And you could play that game of draw a functional group, draw another group on there and try doing it and then see if you can figure out what the relationship is. Ah, now, we have this giant molecule at the bottom. Uh, there's an oxygen underneath the Doceri desktop trial thing here. Uh, I didn't have the trial version, but they told me, I looked at their help site and I was having some problems with something, so they said, oh yeah, just reset the program. So I reset the program and the license just like disappeared. I'm just like, great. Maybe you should tell people, before you reset the program, save your license. Oh, I hate you people. But I don't really hate them. I have a marginal dislike for them right now. We'll see how good their help is. So what is the reactant that gave you this product following ozonolysis? So... Yeah, you just have to play the game of let's attach oxygens and see what we get, okay? Um, so 
I don't know if that part recorded because Doceri Desktop keeps coming up with stuff to tell me. Um, you have a, key, a carbonyl here and a carbonyl here, a carbonyl here and here. So which ones do you attach, right? So let's say I attach this one to this one. Then it would be a one, two, three, four, five, six membered ring. What's the problem with that? It's that when I look at this one, I'd have a one, two, three membered ring, although it's possible. It's going to have a double bond on a three member ring. It's not that likely, okay? What if I went from here? Oops, sorry. So, so eliminate the idea of going like this to this. I'll get rid of that. Another possibility is this to this, right? So that seems fairly reasonable. So that'll be one, two, three, four, five. And that means the other one's connected as one, two, three, four, five, six. So a five-membered ring and a six-membered ring. So now we have to just see, is that like a reasonable structure when we draw it? So an easy way to do these things uh, is first number one of the rings that you're going to build. Okay. So this is one, two, three, four, five, and six. And the reason you do that is because that tells you where the other ring is connected to it. Okay. So if I draw that, I'm going to draw a six-membered ring. And um, between one and six, I'll have a double bond, okay? And so this is one, two, three, four. I'm trying to draw it so that you can see it. I don't think you can actually see that. I could draw really small, but I still don't think you can really read that so well, but it's all right. I'll do that. So that means I have to have another ring connected from three to four. Now, if you count it, one, two, including the two carbons that are there, three, four, five, it's a five-membered ring, okay? So you draw a five-membered ring, connecting from three and four, and where's the other double bond? On one of the sides. On one of the sides on the three, yeah? It would be a little bit more critical, like, like uh, Brian was saying, you can put it on one of the sides. It doesn't really matter in this one because it ends up being symmetric. Um, but if, I had put a, if they had put a functional group on here, let's say they had put a, like a group like that, then it would have mattered like which way you put the pi bond. Okay. By the way, let's say the functional group, <laughs> just for fun, let's say there was a functional group here. How do you know where it is on this ring? You just number this part of the ring, one, two, three, four. And so you start over here and you go one, two, three, four. It's that carbon there. Okay. So placing numbers on it, they're not for nomenclature. It's just so that you can uh, know where things are. If I had a methyl group at that position, that's, that would be where it is. Oh, yeah, because I ended up making it symmetric again, yeah. That's funny. Okay, I can't seem to get away from symmetry. Um, let's see. These are some uh, helpful ideas on when you do it when you're doing addition reaction, right? Analyze the reagent that's going to get added to the double bond. Figure out if there's regioselectivity. I've talked about some regioselectivity that your book doesn't talk about. Okay, so make sure you pay attention to that stuff. But there's Markovnikov and anti-Markovnikov uh, type reactions. Once you've figured out where the things get added, right, where the regioselectivity is, then worry about the stereochemistry. Then you think to yourself, is that a syn addition? You, and it helps if you think about what's the mechanism. Is it a syn addition or is it an anti-addition? Because that'll tell you the orientation of the groups. Or does it go through a carbocation? And those are the basic types of mechanisms that we've looked at. We form three-membered rings and do anti-additions. We form carbocations where we get racemic mixtures. And we've done syn additions where both groups are added to the same side. All right. And like it says here, gosh, practice those mechanisms. 
I promise I will put a couple of mechanisms on the test. Which, by the way, I'm going to just combine with the final. So we have more time to cover material without rushing and... Yeah. So whenever your final is, which I believe is on Thursday... So I'm going to pass over some of these additional problems. I want to do I thought there were better problems at the end here, but there aren't. It just Ah, okay. Nah, too easy. I'm looking for, I had a bunch of extra problems that I stuck at the end. I'm going to make one up now. Or I'm going to do blackboard. I like the blackboards better. Okay, let's say, okay, I'm going to make up a problem. Hopefully there's not too many problems with my problem. Let's say you want to make... And you're starting with that. Okay. So I'm just waiting for you guys to get this written down. We're going to go through how you think about these problems rather than the use of book examples. You can look at the book examples. Okay? This is the first thing that you want to do. So you want to add it. Actually, uh, there's different ways of approaching these problems. Analyze the product. Okay. So in analyzing the product, what do you notice about it? Chlorine's gone. Chlorine's gone. Okay. OH. Anything special about the OH? It's primary, right? So that implies what kind of addition? Anti-Markovnikov, right? Now, the functional group, the CL, is what you have to start with, okay? But you can already sort of envision how the OH got there. How did the OH get there? Well, if it's an anti-Markovnikov addition, right, what did it add to? A double bond. Right? So think through the process backwards like, okay, I have this weird product. It's a, an anti-Markovnikov product. Uh, one of the things I also you should do is you should look at the carbon skeleton. The carbon skeleton didn't change, but we haven't done any carbon skeleton stuff yet, so we're, I'm not going to worry about that. So, so I, I examine the carbon skeleton, and I look at the product, and I say the product has the same skeleton as the, as the reactant, so I'm not going to worry about that part. The OH group is definitely anti-Markovnikov addition, so that has to be some sort of alkene. Okay? So I think about the step in between that the alkene that produced that has to be this. Now here's the thing. We're going we're gonna to try to visualize... transformations and we're not going to worry about the reagents yet this is dat I'm trying to write don't but the pen won't let me 
if I do this. Don't worry. Be happy. <sighs> Such a struggle just to write. Ah, and the reason I, um, I say that is because a lot of times uh, when students work like this, they struggle with the reagents at each step so much that they forget that they can, they can still figure out a correct pathway and then afterwards fill in the reagents. It's, it's more important that you pick a correct pathway than you pick the correct reagents. So in memorizing your mechanism, memorize what functional group transformations you're doing and also memorize the reagents. But keep in mind that solving these problems requires more than just the reagents. And the hard part is the pathway, how you get from place to place. Okay. So I know that's an alkene. Now here's the thing. I have a chlorine over here, right? And I can form an alkene, but I can't form that one, right? There's going to have to be some sort of re re rearrangement, <laughs> just a rearrangement. That's going to be my new signal for it. We're going to do a rearrangement. I like that. Sorry. I won't make fun of you anymore, <laughs> unless I talk about rearrangement. OK, so I'm not going to worry about the reagents, but I know that the alkene was formed from an alkyl halide or something that I did an elimination reaction on, right? So then I back up in my head and I say, okay, I'm going to make an alkene from an alkyl halide. Well, the alkyl halide that could have formed that is this one. Now, why did I pick that one, by the way? Because, well, one, it's the only alkene I can make, right? And then why did I pick that alkyl halide? Um, because I can, I'm thinking about, okay, in my head, I've got to get this functional group to move over somehow so that I can make that double bond, right? So what's interesting about this alkyl halide? Again, I, I, same process, right? I look at this product and say to myself, well, how, do, how did I get that product? Well, I got it from that. Right. How did I get this? Well, I got that from an addition reaction too. Right? How do you make alkyl halides? You make them through addition reactions. But but what's unusual about that? It got stuck. I'm not moving. The, the pointer's not moving anymore. How did? Well, great. <laughs> Curse you. This is an anti-Markovnikov addition. Because if you had done like a Markovnikov addition and that's where the double bond was a carbocation had formed, remember this is where the car carbocation was, right? If that's where the carbocation was formed, where would it have actually been at the end? It would have rearranged. It would have I'm going to start swinging my hips too. Woo. You're all going to shut your eyes. Look away. I can do that because it's not recording me. <laughs> it's recording the board. So to get that, I had to have this alkene. Right? And that I can get from the reactant. Again, keeping the reactant in mind during this process, I work my way backwards and I look at each product and say, how did I get that? And that is a clue to me, how I got that is a clue to me about what the previous reagent was. So I have everything in terms of the pathway done. Go ahead. Question?
your book covers all of this stuff in chapter 12. called retrosynthetic analysis. It's kind of like keeping starting with the end in mind. How did I get there? Right? Cuz you start with the reactant and try to go forward, sometimes it's actually hard because you have too many choices. But when you start with the product, just conceptually there's only one choice, right? And then the thing before it that produced that, there can usually only be a few choices that produce that. So it's a little bit easier to start with the end and work your way back to the beginning. They actually have this thing called the retrosynthetic arrow, and you'll often see these. It's a big two-headed arrow that looks like that. That's known as the retrosynthetic arrow. Is this the butter something that intermediate or a product to just throw them to what help create a scale you're looking at? Yeah, and these are, well, intermediates are not stable usually. These are all stable products. So this, these are all different steps in the reaction. So you know, like when you see in a rea when you see like a hydroboration oxidation, you see one, and then you see two. Those things have to be done sequentially because you produce something in one reaction, maybe purify it, maybe spend a day cleaning it up, putting it in another reaction vessel, and then you do two. Or maybe, you know, you can just add it, but you have to wait for the first reaction to finish before you start the second reaction. I'll give you, there's actually a good example of that in alkyne synthesis stuff that we'll talk about. All right. So, now we have the problem, we have to put all the reagents in, okay? Again, flashcards, memorize the reactions, right? Also memorize the reagents, but when you're doing, trying to figure out what product gets formed, spend some time analyzing the product and working your way backward to the reactant, and then plug in the reagents afterwards. So we're going to do this. I'm going to number these steps. We're going to call this one, two, three, four. So, hmm, what's one? Yep. Strong base elimination, right? So let's say ETO minus. You don't want to use a bulky base because a bulky base would give you the wrong alkene. Two is the anti-Markovnikov addition of a halide. And the, it turns out the only one that you know that does that, this is like the tie-in, is HBr with peroxide. What's uh, three? Another elimination. You have to. It's it's a. You have to do it regio selectively. That is, you can't just use any base, bulky base, right? I I'm almost happy when people just write bulky base rather than the reagent, honestly, because it tells me they know a little bit more about what they're trying to do. So something like T Bach. Oh, not T-box, sorry, that's biochemistry on the brain. T-butoxide. And number four? It's a hydration reaction, right? Uh, any particular kind of hydration reaction? Hydrohalogenation. It's a hydration, right? 
But if you did HCl in water, for example, catalyzed hydration reaction, you would get a carbocation on the secondary carbon, would rearrange, and then the OH would end up where the Cl started, and you'd be like, no, curse you, gods of organic chemistry. It's an anti-Markovnikov hydration reaction, okay? So that's going to be borane, BH3, and THF. That's just the solvent, so don't worry about the THF. I mean, worry about it, but don't worry about what it does. It's a two-step reaction. Sodium hydroxide. doesn't matter what order you put these things in on the sodium hydroxide line. Now, you see how that hard it was like just to remember the reagents? If you try to do the reagents and the steps at the same time, it's really hard. Just do one, do the steps first. Because once you know you have a good logical sequence, then plug the reagents in. And if they don't come to you right away, just say, you know, ant write the note to yourself, anti-Markovnikov hydration. And then later, like if it's on a test or a homework or something or a problem you're working on, it may just come to you and then you just go back, oh, yeah, because, you, you know, there's a lot of problems on a test. You're, Oh, yeah, that's how you do that. And you go back and you fill it all in. You go back, look at that reactions page that I'm going to give you, and say, oh, yeah, he has those reagents there. What did those do? Oh, that does that thing. And then you can go fill it in. So. All right, I'm going to stop that lecture, and then we'll start again with alkynes. Alke